So, yeah, hello everybody. So yeah, as, um, as Megan said, uh, my name's Nancy, but people often just know me as Camp Dad, which is my drag name. I'm a drag king. Um, I started to like figure out my, my relationship to drag when I, when I came to Berlin and I started to, to realize that I was um, a drag king. Um, and I think that that's a lot because of the way in which the drag culture works in Berlin. It's, it's like a really open and, and progressive scene. And I like, was able to figure out like, yeah, my relationship to, to, to drag in this scene. Um, now, when I, um, when I originally started writing this talk, I was going to discuss about the Venus Boys and discuss about being a drag king in a world in which drag is set up for drag queens. Now, by this I'm talking in particular about uh, a certain television programme, which you might have heard of, which is called RuPaul's Drag Race, um, which for some reason has become like the, the arbiter of, of drag. It's become like the, the benchmark for, for a lot of people because for a lot of people, it's like the entry point into finding out what drag is about. And I mean, it was my entry point, to be honest. Like, it's, it's like, it's a big, it's a big part of what, of what drag culture is today. And I was originally going to talk about how it can be difficult being a drag performer who is not um, a cis man doing an impression of a woman within the drag scene because of the way in which RuPaul's Drag Race sets a sort of standard. But then I realised that that talk would get quite boring quite quickly because the answer to that is just, it's patriarchy. It's good old fashioned patriarchy um so that so like yeah that that that's sort of it that's sort of the answer so i was like there's there's another question that needs to be asked like the, there's something underneath this there's something there's something deeper than this that that i feel like we need answers to before we can even start thinking about these sort of dynamics that happen within drag and i think the question that i would like to ask or the question that i would like to try to answer within this this sort of bed talk is what is drag like what is it like what actually is it because because i feel like we hear lots of different definitions and we hear lots of different ideas about about what drag is like for example i've often heard that drag the word drag comes from dressed as a girl dressed as a girl i hear tales about how drag comes from the times of shakespeare when women weren't allowed on the stage because of misogyny, so men would dress as a girl and play all of the women's roles. This is all part of the idea, the, the, the quite often like expressed idea that drag is about changing your gender. I feel like there's a lot of, a lot of these definitions of drag, drag being about dressed as a girl and, and like drag coming from the times of Shakespeare, it's all about drag the crux of drag within these kind of arguments is that drag is about changing your gender. Now, this is quite a, a commonly held belief um, I, I have observed. Like, even, even here in Berlin, where we have quite a progressive drag scene, we have quite, a, we have quite an open like, and challenging drag community in Berlin, even here, quite a prominent hostess of quite a prominent night within Berlin was once trying to encourage the audience to do drag. And she was up on stage and she, she looked out into the audience and she said, everybody should do drag. She was like, everybody should do drag. You should just do it. You should just change your gender for the night. Just do it. Just change your gender for the night. And I was standing there and I was like, what? Like change your gender for the night. Like as if there's just like a magic wand that you can just like grab and just like Cinderella, just like swizzle it around you. And then you just spin around and all of a sudden you're a, you're a different gender for the night. I feel like this belief is, or this idea mm -hmm. that drag is about changing your gender is at best wrong and, and at worst sort of problematic because it peddles this idea that changing your gender is something which is easy. And 
this idea becomes a breeding ground for transphobia. Like a lot of a lot of the transphobic views that I hear from from like trans exclusionary radical feminists, for example, are fears that are grounded in like a, or it's like these fears are grounded in like a, a, a worry that men are going to infest women's spaces, that men are going to pretend to be women and therefore get into women's spaces. And if changing your gender was, was easy, if you could just pick up a wand and swizzle it around and change your gender, then, then these views might be valid. These fears might seem valid. However, changing your gender isn't that easy. So, so these fears aren't necessarily that valid. Like, what, what this host was talking about, what this host was, was referring to when she said change your gender for the night was changing your gender markers. She meant, like, you should, you should dress up as the opposite sex. You should, you should change the way in which you, you dress for the night. But changing your gender markers doesn't necessarily alter the way in which you perform your gender. It doesn't alter your gender performativity. Like, I would like to argue that changing your gender markers doesn't necessarily belong to drag, but it might be more properly defined as cross-dressing. <gasps> Did they just say cross-dressing? Oh, there's, there's like, there's a big like, woo, around, around the term, the term cross-dressing because, because cross-dressing has, has often been used or like historically been used as a way to, to try and put down trans people. Like people say that it's like a transphobic way of, of yeah, trying to put down trans people saying that they're, they're not trans, they're just cross-dressing. But like, I mean, as a trans person, I can hold my hands up and say that I know that that's not true. Like, I know that I'm not, I'm not cross-dressing when I, when I put on a dress, I'm just wearing a dress. But I think that there's still something that can be useful about the term cross-dressing to describe a particular thing. Like, for example, imagine a cis heterosexual mm -hmm. man goes to Pride with his girlfriend and like a group of friends, or like a group of queer friends or whatever, and he goes to Pride and he decides that for the day he's gonna wear a dress at Pride. Like, he's still a man, he still identifies as a man, but he's wearing a dress for the day as a way to sort of experiment with this side of himself. Like, that's great, right? And that's cross-dressing. Like, that's what cross-dressing is. But cross-dressing doesn't define drag. And if drag was about changing your gender, then it would, right? But Cross-dressing, we know, doesn't define drag because of the existence of, for example, like bio queens, like drag queens who were assigned female at birth and who identify as women outside of drag. Like when they get into drag, there is no cross. Yeah, there's just dressing. Similarly, for a trans woman who's a drag queen, there is no cross, or a trans man who's a drag king, or a non-binary person who's got a non-binary drag persona, there is no cross-dressing. There is no cross. There's just dressing. It's just dressing up. So maybe this is a better definition of drag. Maybe, maybe we're getting closer to it now. It's not about cross-dressing, but it's about dressing up. Now, I'd like to talk to you about one of, um, one of my favourite interviews that I've ever seen from a person called Jack Ismanetti. Now, Jack Ismanetti talks about, uh, like, doesn't, I don't think that she necessarily identifies as a drag queen, but she definitely belongs to this culture of drag. She definitely belonged to the, to the very, like, roots of, of this drag culture as it was forming and she identifies as a female impersonator. Now this idea of, of, of female impersonation was something that was so central to the beginnings of, of like drag queen culture. And in the interview with Jackus Minetti, there's this poem where she says, 
Now, when I was 14, I was sent to the psychiatrist by the school. And, and I went eight or 10 times every week to go and see this psychiatrist. And then in the last session, she told me that I should be a female impersonator. And at the time I thought, I thought it was sort of funny, you know? But then later on, I thought that is a good idea. Yes. So that I could be myself. So, so that I could be myself. She should be a female impersonator so that she could be herself. She should, she should dress up as a woman so that she could be herself. I mean, there's clearly something deep going on here, right? There's something deeper than, than just dressing up. It's almost, it's almost as if this dressing up becomes, becomes a key which can open something inside you. It can let out this, this deeper level of performativity. Now, I'd like to relate this idea of this, this rush of something coming up within you to the concept of gender euphoria. Now, gender euphoria is something that is often spoken about within like trans communities and like around transness as sort of the, the opposite to gender dysphoria. So, um, so like gender dysphoria might be when you feel like certain parts of yourself don't fit to the way that you sort of feel and the way that you view yourself. Like there's some sort of disjunct, like the insides and the outsides don't quite match and it's, it's like cognitive dissonance. Gender euphoria is the opposite. Gender euphoria is when it matches. And I mean, y you can imagine, right? Imagine a transmasculine drag king who, who goes on stage and performs their masculinity and is seen in that moment. And everybody in the room experiences this performance and there's this rush. And, like, and the same thing can happen for a trans feminine drag queen. But, but then the same thing can happen. Like imagine, imagine the little gay boy. Imagine the little gay boy who has always had to suppress his feminine side, who for the first time puts on a dress and looks in the mirror and feels beautiful. And there's this rush, this rush of energy, which is gender euphoria. It's this inside coming out. Now, I'd like to refer to this process, this inside coming out as transfiguration. It's like, it's like the, the transubstantiation of the Bible, like when Jesus turned water into wine. Like when a drag performer gets into drag, they're not pretending. There's no pretending there. It's not a man pretending to be a woman, it's a woman. And it's not a woman pretending to be a man, it's a man. Or it's an alien, or it's a cow. Like, it's real. There's something real that's happening here. This dressing up reveals this performativity and it reveals a layer of the self, of selfhood. And I would like to argue that this, this revelation, this bringing to surface, this uncovering is the art of drag. This is where drag becomes art. But it's still not necessarily what drag is. 
Like we've still not necessarily gotten to, gotten to that definition yet. So if this is the art of drag, then what is drag? Now, to be honest, I think that despite all of her faults, RuPaul kind of hit the nail on the head when she said that we're all born naked and the rest is drag. Because I'd like to argue that when a drag queen puts on lipstick, that's drag. But then also, when I put on lipstick, it's drag. When a cisgender woman puts on lipstick, it's drag. Putting on a tie is drag. Shaving your beard is drag or drawing on a beard is drag. Like, I would like to argue that drag is the stuff, like the aggregates from which gender is made. Like drag is the aesthetic markers and the performative gestures from which gender becomes intelligible as a cultural phenomenon. And then it's the job of the drag performer to use these markers, to use this drag to create an artistic meaning. In the same way that like a painter uses paint to create a painting, a drag performer uses drag to create a drag performance. You use this stuff to create artistic meaning. And in the same way that one can also use paint to create a painting or you can use paint to paint the walls of your flat, the walls of your house, you can use drag to create a drag performance which has artistic meaning or you can use drag to create your identity, your sense of self. It's what you put on every morning when you wake up, but you don't even put it on, you just are it. The way that you sit, the way that you stand, the way that you walk, whether you walk with your feet together or apart, all of this, it belongs to drag. So then, I guess in conclusion, I would like to, I would like to say that we hear a lot of talk of, of people saying, like, do drag, you should do drag, do it. And I feel like I would like to say that you already are. You're doing drag. We all are, all of the time. It's not about doing it. It's about using it. It's about being aware of it. Being aware of the ways in which it creates your identity, creates the dynamics within your social groups. Being aware of the ways in which it can create joy in your life. Being aware of the ways in which it can make you feel euphoria. That's drag. Thank you for coming to my bed talk. <laughs> I had to, come on. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.